Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. And welcome to today's webinar. Our topic is expansion of maritime activity in the Bering Strait region, mitigating existing and future risks. My name is David Balton. I'm a senior fellow with the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington, DC, and I will serve as the moderator of the webinar. Today's webinar is actually the first of four events uh, that the Wilson Center's Polar Institute is hosting this week. Our other programs will also cover fascinating and timely issues pertaining to both the Arctic and Antarctic regions. A full list of the week's event events can be found on the Polar Institute's website. Tomorrow, we will also release the inaugural edition of the Polar Institute's Polar Perspectives publication series. Our first edition is entitled, Is it Time for a Paradigm Shift in How Antarctic Tourism is Controlled? This is authored by Dr. Peter Carey, one of our global fellows in the Polar Institute. And finally, all of us at the Polar Institute appreciate the critical support provided by A2A Railway and Olganek Corporation for making possible programs like these throughout the year. I would like to thank, um, begin today's event by thanking our partners in this endeavor, the World Wildlife Fund, particularly Margaret Williams and her colleagues, and the University of New Hampshire's Coastal Response Research Center, particularly Nancy Kinner and her colleagues. And finally, I wish to thank our speakers today, whom I will introduce in a moment, and of course, all of you who are taking time to be with us today. A few housekeeping matters. Our webinar is nominally scheduled for one hour, but if there are a lot of questions, we have the ability to run a bit longer, say an hour, 15 minutes if necessary. And if those of you who are listening in have questions, please send them by email to polar P-O-L-A-R at wilsoncenter.org. That's polar at wilsoncenter.org. I'll repeat that later as well. We will take up your questions following the final presentation. Please be aware that today's event is being recorded. The Wilson Center will make available the video file on our website, wilsoncenter.org, for public viewing. Now to our topic. The Bering Strait region is a remarkable part of the world. The Bering Strait links the Arctic Ocean and the Bering Sea. Uh, the Russian Federation and the United States on either side of the strait share a long history in addressing matters arising in this region. The region is home to numerous communities, including Arctic indigenous communities, whose ancestors have lived in the area for countless generations. Many of today's inhabitants, like those who lived there in the past, depend on the natural resources of the Bering Straits, uh, Strait region's marine environment for sustenance, livelihood, and culture. The region is also changing rapidly, driven largely by a warming climate. As the sea ice in the region and in the rest of the Arctic recedes for longer periods each year, the ocean itself is changing, as are the human uses of the ocean. The Bering Strait has seen a significant increase in ship traffic in the past decade, a trend that is almost certain to continue. The increasing, increasing ship traffic brings with it a number of risks, as we will hear from our speakers. Some measures have already been taken to mitigate these risks, but most observers agree that more needs to be done. Recently, WWF issued a report on this topic that provided one of the inspirations for this webinar it's called Safety at the Helm, a plan for smart shipping through the Bering Strait. You can find the report on WWF's website, also on our website, the Wilson Center. We've put a link to it there. Well, enough from me. I'd like now to introduce our speakers. Yari Walker is an Alaska native, a Yupik from St. Lawrence Island in the Bering Sea. Yari is currently a student at Alaska Pacific University. She's also the indigenous consultant at Alaska Pacific University. Ed Page is the executive director of the Marine Exchange of Alaska. Captain Page is a retired Coast Guard officer with more than 50 years experience in the maritime field, 30 of which have been in Alaska. His involvement in the Exxon Valdez oil spill response 
and other maritime emergencies has engaged him in the implementation of innovative risk manage, uh, mitigating measures for vessels operating in the Alaska region. Mark Everett is with the US Coast Guard's District 17 in Alaska. He is serving as D-17's Incident Management and Preparedness Advisor. He is also co-chair of the Joint Planning Group established pursuant to the US-Russia Joint Marine Pollution Contingency Plan. Dr. Natalia Kudeva is counselor to the director of the Marine Rescue Service in the Russian Federation's Ministry of Transport. She is also co-chair of the Joint Planning Group for the Russia-US Joint Marine Pollution Contingency Plan. For more than two decades, Dr. Kudeva has led Russian delegations to various international bodies including the IMO's Marine Environmental Protection Committee and the Arctic Council's Working Group on Emergency Preparedness, Prevention and Response. And finally, Margaret Williams leads the US Arctic Program for World Wildlife Fund. She has worked for 25 years on conservation issues in Russia and Alaska and is based now in Anchorage, Alaska. And so, without further ado, I'd like to offer the floor first to Yari Walker. Yari, take it away. Good morning, Natatakati. Kung ay piusun at kay Yari, sibo ka mong tingong at sibo ng mong ay maram ka ng kung atawi ka nga. Thank you for inviting me to speak today. My Yupik name is Yari, originally from Saint Lawrence Island. My clan is ay maram ka, which means strong people. And our sub-clan is Sandakamalungok, we are people of the reindeer. My mother's clan is Kiwagami, she's people of Kiwa. And her clan people originally came from Chakotka. And her village, uh, the village that her people came from in our Yupik language is called Kiwa, which is, uh, that's why she's Kiwagami. So I come from the, the Bering Sea. The Bering Sea means a whole lot to me. Um, we rely heavily on the animals for survival purposes from the Bering Sea. And I was just telling my husband last night that I was raised in the ocean and how much I miss the Bering Sea. I miss smelling the ocean. Um, all my life growing up, my family would move from campsite to campsite for survival purposes, and the first stop would always be fish camp, where we would fish for all kinds of fish to store away for the winter. Uh, we would camp there for about a month, and we would dry most of the fish. And my father would move the fish after it dried. He would bring it back to the village and come back to fish camp. And then we would move on to the next camp, where we would also uh, hunt for seals and reindeer and some walrus, and then we would move on to the next camp. And we would do that until uh, it was time to start school again. But um, our culture, we, we, we have a very strong culture. And um, my people on the other side in uh, Siberia, uh, the people of Chukotka, we speak the same language as they do. Um, it's called Siberian Yupik. So I learned that my people's clan originated from Chukotka also. So when we did lose contact with our friends and relatives in Chukotka for over 50 years during Cold War, and it was very difficult for us because the people of Chukotka are our friends and relatives. And when Reagan and Gorbachev raised the Iron Curtain together, the people of Chukotka jumped on their skin boats and traveled to St. Lawrence Island. And this was a very joyous time for both the people of St. Lawrence Island and Chukotka. Um, and it was nice to know that some of our people from there still spoke our language fluently. And that's how we were able to locate our last, our lost family through our clan system because they knew what clan they came from. Um, so it was, it was very emotional and joyous for us. Long before explorers arrived, our people had no borders. So that's why we were able to 
travel back and forth freely. So when I speak to my children, I always remind them, you are first Yupik before anything else. You're, you are Yupik first before you are an American citizen. And the people of, of Chukotka, of Russia, those are our friends and relatives. So never let that border define who you are because we are the same people as the people of Chukotka. And coming from a culture um, who subsists for survival, it's very important for us. Every season brings different reasons. And my son was telling me, my oldest son is 33 years old. He's a whaling captain. We have two different whaling seasons. We have the springtime and the fall time. He was telling me stories of how when he makes his hunting tools, he puts good energy into his hunting tools. He, and I asked him why he does that. I already knew why. I just wanted to hear his story. He said that when you put good energy into your hunting tools, the spirits of the animals can feel it. And when you are a positive person, the spirits of the animals can feel it and they give themselves to you. And you treat the animals with a lot of respect. So when people question my people why we hunt for seals and whales, I like to explain to them that when Creator made Earth, he put all kinds of animals in every part of the world. Uh, my husband is non-native from North Carolina. When he first questioned me, I looked at him and said, well, I have questions for you. I said, tell me in the waters of New York City, are you going to find such animals as walruses? He said, no. In the lands of Miami, Florida, are you going to find polar bears? He said, no. In Salt Lake City, Utah, are you going to find caribou? He said, no. In Los Angeles, California, are you going to find moose? He said, no. And I said, way up north in Alaska, there's a town called Barrow. Are you going to find kangaroos? He said, no. And then I said, in Anchorage, are you going to find zebras? He laughed and said, no. I said, my point is, this is the way Earth was made. Creator put all kinds of animals in every part of the world. And on St. Lawrence Island in the Bering Sea, Creator provided for my people seals, walruses, whales. And then we have the migratory birds and the reindeer, and that's why we hunt for these animals. Creator put the first you, the first human in a kayak, in a kayak, and it washed up on the beach. The animals were curious, so they pulled in the kayak, and inside they saw a creature. He was sleeping. And the, and the polar bear sees the creature and says, look at this creature. He's not going to survive. He's going to freeze to death. He doesn't have fur like us. And the reindeer says, he can't hunt like us. He doesn't have claws or teeth like us. He's not going to make it. And we're going to call him Yuk. That's right, he's human. He's Yupik. And we must give ourselves to this Yupik because without us, he won't be able to survive as long as he respects us. Eventually, the Yuk woke up. The animals looked at him and said, you are Yuk. You're Yupik. We have decided together as animals that we will give ourselves to you as long as you respect us. Because without our fur, you'll freeze to death. Without our bones, you cannot make tools. Without our meat, you cannot eat. So as long as you respect us, we will give ourselves to you. You must not waste and you must share. And that's the story of the first you. So that's how much important the Bering Sea is to my people of St. Lawrence Island and to the people of Chukotka. Because especially in the wintertime, about 90% of our people are unemployed. So therefore, we rely heavily on the animals from the Bering Sea. And we as Yupik people believe that the Bering Sea is alive. We believe as Yupik people that everything is alive and everything has a spirit. So we must treat these environments and these places with a lot of respect because they take care of us as human beings. Thank you guys for allowing me to speak this morning. I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to this gentleman over here. Thank you. Uh, Yari, thank you very much uh, for those words of wisdom uh, spoken from the heart. Our next speaker is uh, Ed Page. Ed, take it away. But you have to unmute yourself.
Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm going to talk about <clears throat> managing the risk to an acceptable level of this increased maritime activity in the Arctic. Uh, Yari talked about the disruption, uh, concerns about disruption in their way of life. And so as you look at maritime activity increasing, it can lead to disruption. It can interfere with whaling if it's not managed some way, if it's not some guidelines to minimize impacts. Of, and we're still, if there's a marine casualty, such as like the Exxon Valdez, it can be disastrous. So there's two things we're trying to prevent. It's just the operational adverse impacts of increased maritime activity and also from maritime casualties from occurring. During my Coast Guard career, I've been involved with thousands of maritime incidents and search and rescue cases and the loss of life and oil spills and other casualties. And over a period of time, I, I really get a better appreciation of the importance of preventing things because that's, you know, much more impactful if you can prevent it from happening in the first place. I've lost friends at sea who perish at sea. We just prevented that other tools. And when I found out there's technology can help us get there. So if I get the next slide here, I'm, ta I'm talking about maritime domain management. And I can simplify somewhat of my thoughts when I was during a New York Times was referring to this, more ships in the Arctic, fears of disaster arise. And I, I, I basically pretty clearly told them I'm focusing on keeping things from going wrong. That's my, that's my focus, preventing things from going wrong. And through technology and information, we can really minimize adverse impacts of increased maritime activity. I have the next slide. Um, so this is my focus on right now, my short presentation. I'm gonna talk about prevention and intervention. I'm not gonna talk about response. So when I talk about prevention, if I can make an analogy that people are more comfortable with, on the highways, we have speed limits and we have uh, roads to prevent you know, accidents. It's traffic management. At sea, we have sea traffic management. We've also, in Alaska, have designed a very large uh, uh, management scheme using technology where we're tracking vessels and saying, stay out of these areas, reduce your speed in these particular areas. And if we see something go wrong, then we try to intervene. So like seat belts, if, if the speed limit doesn't work and someone still has an accident, the seatbelts mitigate, mitigate those adverse impacts so you don't get injured so much. So in our case, intervention is if we know something's going wrong, we have information on it, we can intervene in some manner. That picture is of a cruise ship that broke down off the coast of Norway. What intervened was two things. An anchor, there was shallow enough, they could anchor the vessel and stop it from hitting the beach. And then time, because they had time to get technicians 24 hours later to could fix the problem and get the vessel underway intervene, preventing the marine casualty. Then the last step is management mitigation, ambulances and oil spill response. I'm not gonna talk about them. They have, a, they have a role, they have a place, they're needed, but I'm putting more focus on prevention and intervention. So I have the next slide, if I could please. So in a very simple context, we're gonna have human error, we're gonna have machinery failure. And we can minimize uh, uh, learning from other marine casualties, we can prevent and intervene with information, with time and capabilities. So if we can track vessels and know when they're in distress, we can track to make sure they're complying with the distance offshore to be safe. They can comply with speed limits. Then we have a better chance of minimizing adverse impacts. If something does go wrong, if we know early on, the sooner you know about a fire, the greater chance you can have to put it out. If you wait an hour before you call the fire department, it's a bad thing. So the sooner you know about it, the better chance you have to mitigate the consequences. And then you need capabilities. You need something to be able to handle an emergency. So, and that could be, if you know where the vessels are, they can help, that'll save the day also. Next slide. So when they talk about the Arctic Council, and I know uh, Dave Bolton has been very involved in all this deliberation on an international scheme, uh, but one of the simple things they came across is completing an AIS receiver network. AIS is automatic identification system. It's a transponder system, it's technology. So now we can see where vessels are. Beforehand, the only time you saw vessels when they're in port, when they disappeared out of the port, they disappeared. But now we need the AIS information so we know where vessels are to minimize uh, adverse impacts, like the marine mammals, the hunting of marine mammals. You don't want ships driving right through a whaling party, not to mention disruption of the whales, but also potentially harm to the whalers themselves. So that's all about information. AIS is an information tool, automatic identification system. Next, next slide. And so to that end, I, I think that you know, we've built a system in Alaska whereby we have 130 systems of receiving information. 
and transmit information and a 24 hour operation center that is uh, basically constantly reporting where vessels are and we contact the vessel we're saying the wrong location or is a problem we notify the coast guard and we basically engage so what we see is there any more slides after this david because i think mine got truncated that's the last slide okay so what we see is that if we can span uh, uh, electronic navigation these tools where we can communicate back and forth the vessels which is working right now we have intervened many many times countless number of times where we contact the vessel say you go in the wrong area you enter an area to be avoided you're you're adrift can we find a tug for you if we can span these capabilities in the arctic then help identify problems and prevent things and respond to community casualties uh, see traffic management measures. There are traffic lanes or the distances offshore, the areas to be avoided. Those are things that can actually outline risk mitigating measures and practices that, that minimize the potential of in, impacting uh, native way of life as far as with whaling activity or hunting and not have large vessels transit those areas. And then in some cases, that's a dynamic situation. You just can't put it and put it in a book and say, stay out of these areas because it changes. The whales move about, the walrus move about. So you have to have a dynamic marine protect area scheme and, and agencies need to be involved in providing for that. And lastly, this is a joint effort. You know, obviously we look, Russian colleagues are across the other side of the strait. We, have, we need a, a, a stronger domestic, but also bilateral. And the tools exist right now. Right down below me, right, there's people 24 hours a day in my office monitoring ships and we can share all that information with our colleagues across the other side with the russians we can identify practices and procedures short of even regulations just stands of care and we notify a mayor they're doing something wrong they respond right away and so this there are solutions i think there we shouldn't throw our hands up and say we have a problem we actually we should say we have a solution in place right now and we can embellish that and even do better over time so that's my perspective on What's happening? Ed, thanks very much. That is a very valuable perspective to us. Um, a number of questions are occurring to me as you're speaking, but we will move ahead instead to our next speaker, Mark Everett. The floor is yours, sir. Well, thank you, Ambassador Bolton. Appreciate that very much. And uh, on behalf of Rear Admiral Matt Bell, our 17th Coast Guard District Commander, thanks for the invitation to the Coast Guard to participate uh, in the panel today. Before I begin, I would like to recommend to the audience to review the U.S. Coast Guard's Arctic Strategic Outlook. There is a link to that document on my last slide. You can also just Google Coast Guard Arctic Strategic Outlook and find that document. Uh, and Captain Page mentioned the Bering Strait uh, traffic management scheme. I'd also like to let uh, the organizers uh, display perhaps a little bit later uh, a graphic of a proposed Alaskan Arctic Coast port access route study similar to the Bering Strait uh, cars done a few years ago. Hope we have some time to take a look at that proposal later on in the in the webinar. Uh, great, so we've covered prevention. Uh, Captain Page did a great job talking about intervention. Uh, I'll focus primarily on Coast Guard perspectives on domestic and international marine environmental preparedness and response, which is kind of my bread and butter. So starting on the domestic side, oh, next slide, please, I'm sorry. <clears throat> right, on the domestic side, when we're talking about mitigating risk, prevention is always preferred to response. Uh, but we have to be ready to respond. And the heartbeat of response is planning. And not just planning in, an, in a bubble or an isolation, but planning which includes stakeholders, the community involved, tribal involvement. These are, this community level involvement is key to effective preparedness to respond. The graphic that you see is, uh, depicts the interlocking system of planning and plans that is prescribed in federal law. Uh, under the US regime, the potential polluter, whether that is a facility or whether that's a vessel, is responsible for the pollution. This is called the responsible party. Vessels are required to have a vessel response plan. Uh, that's the blue arrow on your graphic. Uh, vessel response plans are regulated by the U.S. Coast Guard for certain vessels calling upon U.S. ports. 
uh, the vessel owner operator generating the potential pollution is responsible to develop, maintain, and have approved uh, a vessel response plan. Uh, the International Maritime Organization also has some basic requirements for vessel prevention and vessel response plans. Uh, these are called SOPEPs, Shipboard Oil Pollution Emergency Plan. So even for vessels that are not bound uh, into or out of a U.S. port, there is a baseline of protection uh, for those vessels in terms of planning for pollution. In the coastal zone of the United States, the Coast Guard captain of the port uh, also has another role called Federal On-Scene Coordinator, uh, or FOSC. The FOSC oversees an interagency committee that is responsible for the development of the Area Contingency Plan. Uh, that is the red arrow on your graphic. The ACP describes the organization and procedures and response resources that would be needed to respond uh, in, a, in the event of a spill. And it also helps quickly identify natural, economic, and cultural resources that are priorities to be protected. Now, each area contingency plan must be capable of addressing a worst case discharge from a pollution source in that unique area of the country. The, the area contingency plan covering the Bering Strait it is called the Arctic and Western Alaska Area Contingency Plan, and that is under the responsibility of the Coast Guard Captain of the Port for Arctic and Western Alaska at Coast Guard Sector Anchorage, and that captain is Captain Leanne Lusk. Uh, Coast, uh, the Alaska Regional Response Team maintains a regional contingency plan that covers the entire region. That's the green arrow on your graphic. And in Alaska, we're kind of unique because the state, the region, and the Coast Guard District are, are all the same uh, geography. The regional response plan covers policy for the entire region, not just a captain of the port zone. Uh, and these are main, the ACP and the RCP are maintained in cooperation with the state of Alaska, and they meet the state of Alaska's requirements under their statutes. Next slide, please. So the red shaded area is the Western Alaska captain of the port zone, and it defines the boundaries of the Arctic and Western Alaska area contingency plan. Uh, so you can see that uh, it covers a very broad area. Uh, that's the majority of the state and the state's waters. Uh, you can see that it, this, uh, this effort to develop comprehensive area contingency plans does address or speak to recommendation number four in the WWF report. Now, the big major challenge for us is getting the right people to the table to have participation in the area committee so that they can provide relevant in input for that planning. Uh, typically, it's a funding limitation, especially for participation from people in remote communities. Next slide, please. So turning to response, uh, due to economies of scale, the vessel owner operators responsible for these vessel response plans typically pre-contract with oil spill removal organizations or OSROs uh, for their pollution response expertise and capability rather than each vessel owner operator uh, maintaining that capability themselves. So in responding to a spill, the efforts of the responsible party and the OSRO are overseen by the Coast Guard Federal On-Scene Coordinator in coordination with the state on-scene coordinator and we organize ourselves in a unified command around the principles of the incident command system. Several OSROs in the state of Alaska have the capability to deploy to the Bering Strait. The nearest of those OSROs geographically is Alaska Shadow. They have equipment pre-staged in Nome, uh, but OSROs also operate in coordination with one another. They can contract with one another to bring in larger scale national and even international capabilities such as oil spill response vessels, aircraft, specialized or purpose built equipment and additional personnel. The responsible party and in the OSRO working on a response to a spill 
under the supervision of a federal on-scene coordinator. Uh, if the FOSC feels that the response is ineffective, uh, if it's not moving along uh, as it should, uh, he has the authority to federalize the response. In, order, in other words, for the U.S. government to take over the response uh, and to begin uh, supervising the response to that spill. Uh, the Coast Guard has its own oil spill response personnel and capabilities. We have caches of equipment that are pre-staged around the state. Uh, we have ocean going vessels capable of skimming and decanting. We have deployable forces such as the National Strike Force, the Pacific Strike Team, which is in California, and pre-designated incident management teams in addition to other specialized response teams that we can bring in from all over the country. A, a complex response which demands a high degree of interagency collaboration or potentially a whole of government effort uh, in a situation like that, we would typically think the Deepwater Horizon spill uh, back in 2010 in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, the Commandant of the Coast Guard in an, in an instance like that can declare a spill of national significance. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, turning to international from domestic, uh, the, the WWF report does a great job of describing the IMO's regulatory regime, touching upon the polar code and routing measures and things of that sort. So I won't focus on IMO, <clears throat> but I will just quickly mention uh, the multinational Arctic Council it was mentioned earlier. Uh, eight Arctic nations, including the US and Russia and permanent participants, they have a working group called Emergency Prevention Preparedness and Response, or EPPR, and they focus on collaboration for emergencies and they main, uh, maintain an international agreement uh, which provides a framework for spills uh, threatening sovereign waters. Uh, in closing, I'll mention the Russia-US uh, international agreement, what we call the, the uh, JCP, the Joint Contingency Plan. We have a long-standing bilateral relationship and agreement between these two nations for preparedness and response to pollution events in the Bering and Chukchi Seas. Uh, the Joint Planning Group, of which I'm the co-chair, uh, we meet uh, together at least every 18 months. We exercise at least once every five years. The latest of those exercises was in November of 2018 in Sakhalin, we did a joint exercise. The scenario was a vessel collision uh, and a spill of 5,000 metric tons of heavy fuel oil into the Russian side of the Bering Strait uh, with a modeled trajectory toward the US side. Uh, that event highlighted the potential capabilities of the use of uh, NOAA's IRMA tool, Environmental Response Management Application, which is a GIS-based system used for passing back and forth complex information in a graphical format. Uh, Russia and the US had plans to meet again in May of this year. Those have been postponed but not canceled. Uh, we hope to get together uh, either later this year or in the spring and to renew our efforts to continue to evaluate that Bering Strait spill scenario <clears throat> with an additional tabletop exercise and focus more on real-time response information using the IRMA tool. Uh, finally, we do use a two-year work plan to keep our, our bilateral efforts on track. Things like coordination of communication drills, tracking our milestones, and holding to a meeting schedule. Uh, so I think we'll just close with that. Uh, final slide, please. And you'll see there toward the bottom of that slide the the address for that Arctic Strategic Outlook document. Uh, that concludes my remarks pending your questions. Thanks very much, Mark. Uh, we're privileged to have you here and also your partner in the Joint Planning Group, who is uh, our next speaker, Dr. Natalia Kuteva. Dr. Kuteva, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, our moderator. Uh, first of all, many thanks, um, Wilson Center. I'm not sure we can hear you, Dr. Kuteva. Can others hear her? 
No. Um, wonder if I could ask our technical experts to help out with the audio problem. Um, I think that's on her and David. Uh, everything else is fine. So um, you might want to move, ahead, maybe move to the next uh, speaker and see if her tech team can troubleshoot it for her. Um, okay. Actually, I think we may have lost her entirely. So perhaps. Uh, you just come back on. Let's see. Yeah. Hold on one moment. Do you hear me? Yes, I do. Uh, very you good. Hear me, but anything happened with uh, communication line. Um, next yeah, slide, yeah. please. <laughs> uh, no, it's. Uh, Maybe the slide before that. No, next slide, please. Uh, yes, okay. Uh, first of all, uh, I, don't, I don't know what you listen, uh, but nevertheless, I would like to repeat that um, I um, express uh, our gratitude to Wilson Center for organizing these events, and I thank Mark for informing uh, us about our bilateral agreement. And I would like to stress that Russian Federation uh, considers very important this agreement especially regarding the work of the provisions of GCP under regular exercises, such as communication exercise and uh, top table and the large scale oil spill response exercise. Uh, accordingly to the work plan, MRS is planning to organize and conduct communication exercise this fall. We will inform U.S. Coast Guard about the concrete date before, because preliminary we are planning to conduct this exercise in October. And uh, moreover, of course, our common objective uh, would be, um, should be large-scale oil spill response exercise, because the last one was in last century, in 1998. <laughs> and now, uh, large, uh, next slide, please. Yes, um, now we are, I, I am um, going to inform about IMO activities in Bering Strait region. You see uh, that um, uh, this region under the polar code requirement, mm -hmm. on the left side you see the uh, scope of polar code. And uh, now um, under the MEPC, Marine Environment Protection Committee, activity uh, is considering the most stro strange, strong regulation uh, of um, prevention pollution in this area and uh, more wider in Arctic uh, waters. Uh, under the uh, pollution, uh, uh, pollution Preparedness Response Subcommittee, PPR, uh, now is considering uh, two uh, aspect of this uh, problem. Firstly, uh, prohibition of uh, use and carriage of heavy fuel oil as fuel by ships in Arctic waters. And, uh, and the, uh, another side, um, the guidelines on measures to reduce risks of use and carriage of HFO as fuel by ships in Arctic waters. These guidelines is developed under the PPR, under the correspondence group, which established by PPR 6, and then reestablished by PPR 7 in February this year. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 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 at the PPR 7, it was developed draft amendments to MAPL Annex 1, namely prohibition on the use and carriage for use as fuel of HFO by ships in Arctic water. Uh, regarding this uh, amendment, uh, it will, uh, shall be prohibited in Arctic water to use such type of fuel on and after July 2024. Mm. Next slide, please. No, no, excuse me, pre pre one, previous one, excuse me. And uh, in regards to um, the, uh, the guidelines uh, on uh, 
measures to reduce risks of use and carriage of HFO as fuel by ships in Arctic waters. These guidelines should be used by the coastal states for the temporary wave from the prohibition in question for their ships while operating in their waters. And um, the above guidelines um, uh, covers uh, the different aspects of navigation measures. Uh, and um, uh, such as uh, hydrographic surveys, the chartered date for risk mitigation, sea watch organization on board, ice advisor, and etc. Also, under the guidelines is considering the matter of ship operation, HFO bunkering, communication, and uh, enhanced uh, preparedness for emergencies of HFO spills and early spill detection and response, and of course, training and drills. Um, now, uh, these guidelines um, is uh, under the consideration by correspondence group. Uh, now, uh, it's uh, third round of consideration. Uh, the last uh, draft version um, was distributed uh, this month, uh, 19th of this month, with deadline of next communication, August 25. Uh, many, uh, practically, uh, may say that all Arctic uh, states are participated in the activity of correspondence group, and of course, uh, Russian Federation and US. And uh, next, please, slide. As now, there are two outstanding but uh, very important issues. First, uh, established so-called sunset uh, provisions. Because uh, some participants of correspondence group consider that guidelines are only relevant for the purpose of granting waves, and thus would be redundant in the time of the heavy fuel oil ban would, uh, would inter force in 2029. But in our opinion, the provisions of guidelines are covered not only measures for reduced risk of heavy fuel oil spills. Uh, the provisions of these guidelines could be used for um, prevention and for mitigation measures as a type of fuel, such as distillate. And therefore, uh, in our opinion, it's uh, fully unnecessary uh, to establish such um, uh, so-called sunset provisions. And second um, outstanding issues, uh, some participants consider uh, that uh, specifying equipment and the items in ports and on the board of um, response vessels uh, is too uh, prescriptive, but uh, we consider that without such recommendation to maritime administration, which are considered as a reference point for decision making, uh, the relevant paragraph of guidelines will lose their significance and turn into general declaration and will not contribute to proper staffing of response centers. Therefore, Russian Federation proposed to keep um, this paragraph as it is. And I would like to take this opportunities and um, ask uh, WWF and other environmental organizations uh, which have uh, observer status of IMO uh, to express uh, their position on the above matters because it's very important for us how these guidelines will uh, forward ahead and uh, in which form uh, these guidelines will submit to um, final consideration to eight session of PPR, which uh, now preliminary scheduled in general last year. But uh, frankly speaking, now I don't know when it will be um, carried out due to uh, some uncertainty situation with IMO schedule of other meeting. And uh, at the end, I would like to mention that our nation, nations uh, have good example of joint cooperation in this um, region when in uh, February 
18, uh, our nations uh, submitted, uh, joint submitted to NCSR subcommittee of IMO regarding establishment of two-way routes and prosecution areas in the Bering Sea and Bering Strait. Accordingly to this proposal, um, it was established six recommendatory two-way routes and six prosecutionary areas in the Bering Sea and uh, Bering Strait. Thank you for your attention. And thank you, Dr. Kuteva. I particularly appreciate your willingness to uh, work into the evening in order to be with us today. Um, and now our final speaker, I'm a friend and colleague, Margaret Williams. Margaret, the floor is yours. Hi, thanks, Dave. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. can okay, okay, great. Great, well, I just, um, I'll just say a few words as we wrap up the panel and hopefully there will be a, the time for questions. I, I wanted to come back uh, and remind our listeners once again as to why we are here and why we hosted this panel. And that is because of the extraordinary values of the Bering Strait. This is a place of incredible cultural diversity and cultural heritage for both Russia and the US. As Yari pointed out, people have been and still are living uh, in a way that connects them to the land and the seas in such a tight manner. Um, this picture is a, a family I met in Chukotka quite a few years ago of reindeer herders who live on the, uh, the coast of Chukotka. And next slide. And the Bering Strait is also an incredible place of vibrant biodiversity. This is one of the super marine mammal superhighways of the world where 18,000 bowhead whales and thousands of gray whales and beluga whales and polar bears and walruses and seals, millions of birds are coming every year because there is so much food here and the, the environment is so rich and uh, vibrant. And uh, collectively, all of us uh, on the speaker panel and those of us listening have a responsibility now to make sure it stays that way. Obviously, climate change is transforming the environment, but we have a lot of opportunities, as Ed says, <laughs> there are a lot of solutions at hand to ensure that we can keep this place a clean and, and healthy environment. And I just wanted to, last slide, uh, draw your attention to the report uh, that World Wildlife Fund recently published. We have a number of recommendations on the way, uh, ways forward, which we believe can help to integrate those prevention measures that Ed spoke of and um, to also prepare for response. And, and once uh, my last uh, remark is that this has been an area of a collaboration and cooperation across the boundary. It really takes two countries to ensure that this transboundary region will remain uh, safe and clean and a healthy place for communities to continue to thrive. So we need to make sure that cooperation goes forward um, as it has been. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Margaret. And thanks very much uh, to all of our speakers. Uh, we do have time now for questions from our listeners. Those of you who uh, wish to submit question, questions, please do so by email to the following address, polar, P-O-L-A-R, at wilsoncenter.org, polar at wilsoncenter.org. Uh, those questions will be relayed to me, and uh, as I get them, I'll be happy to uh, pose them to uh, the speakers. If uh, a particular question is directed to a particular speaker, it would be helpful if you would indicate that in the question. And while we're waiting for um, the first question from uh, the audience, uh, I wonder if um, Dr. Kutieva, I might ask you a question to, uh, to get started. Uh, you mentioned the joint effort by the US and the Russian Federation in 2018 to bring a um, proposal for a traffic separation scheme to the IMO, which was adopted. Um, I'm wondering whether in your judgment, there is more that can be done uh, to improve upon uh, the traffic separation scheme. And there's one recommendation I saw from WWF in particular relating to a possible area to be avoided in and around the Diomed Islands. I'm wondering if the Russian Federation uh, thinks that would be a good idea to pursue and what the next step uh, to do so might be. 
Dr. Kudeva, do you have a response? And please, you'll have to unmute first. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, frankly speaking, I um, didn't uh, uh, much involved in uh, development of the joint submission in question. But as I remember, uh, at the time of um, prepare this um, submission, it uh, was discussed the matter of area which should be avoided. But uh, on the uh, time of developing this uh, joint submission, it was not realized. Therefore, um, such uh, proposal concerning such area could uh, take uh, on board and consider uh, in future uh, jointly how it could be uh, developed and maybe after uh, mutual agreement, how it could be submitted to IMO. Because uh, as I know, the, it was such idea also includes area which should be avoided. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, we have uh, one question from our uh, listeners. It's directed to uh, Ed Page. Uh, Captain, you have a question. You spoke um, about dynamic marine protected areas. Somebody wants to know how would they work in practice? Well, in practice, once someone has some information about a presence of whales or walrus are hauled out of a beach area that normally wouldn't be, uh, they would communicate that to a resource agent, whether the Coast Guard or Fish and Wildlife Service or NOAA. And then there's a technology exists. In fact, we've worked with the Coast Guard. They recognize the Arctic's a different area. We did a study called the Arctic Next Generation Navigational Safety Information System, where we can develop and have developed already some communication centers that send via AIS to a vessel directly to that specific vessel and can say, you're entering an area to be avoided. Please move out of the area or move this location. And that could be a location where there's active whaling activity or the presence of whales or a walrus, what have you. So it's called transmitters, ATON transmitters or uh, AIS ATONs, but automatic identification system technologies that can automatically detect the vessel in the area and automatically send a message to the vessel, say you're entering the wrong area. So maybe it's somewhat along the lines where you're driving along on the highway and there's no policeman with a radar gun, but you see the sign show up. It says your speed is 55, but the speed limit is 45. And what do you do? You stand on, you jam on the brakes, you slow down to 45, probably 40 actually. So the fact is that these technologies exist right now and in, in place, they haven't been fully developed and fleshed out, but it's understanding we're not gonna put the standard buoys or Coast Guard boats or lighthouses, they don't work up in the Arctic because of ice and other concentrations and other issues. But there's a technology now that can actually manage traffic where beforehand it was the wild west, there was no control whatsoever, there can be a lot of control. Thanks very much, Ed. Um, we have another question that's coming from listeners. It's not directed to anybody in particular, but I suspect that Margaret might want to take a crack at it. Um, so let me ask you first, and if others wish to jump in, of course. Um, the question uh, boiled down to its essence is, the, the steps that have been taken so far, in your judgment, do they create a kind of integrated system for mitigating the risks that we have a uh, risk of different kinds of collisions, of oil spills, other types of environmental risks in the area in the face of what is likely to be uh, growing vessel traffic. Uh, we have, we've heard about a number of steps that have already been taken, including jointly by the US and Russia. Uh, but in your judgment, is it, uh, do, we, do we have today what you would consider to be an integrated system yet? That's such a good question and so important. I, I, I think, I think it's important also to hear from everyone else, but I, I feel like the tools are in place and we have we have a lot of tools at hand, but we're not quite there. And we really have to, This I think this transboundary collaboration is critical to make sure that we have really great communication, that uh, communities have the resources also in place to respond and that people know who on the Russian side to call and Russians, the Russian side knows who to call on the American side. and and I'm sure Mark can comment, but I think we're getting there. Uh, and the, the system that Ed has developed is, is critical. So seeing that expansion and full integration on the Russian side 
the, the concept of the IRMA tool, the emergency response management application is very valuable. That's again, we hope we don't ever get to having to respond because the prevention is so key, but we're not quite there with the fully integrated bilateral IRMA and a bilateral tool. So there's still some work to do and, and I think we're going the right direction. Okay, does anyone else? Yes, Mark, I want to uh, take a crack at that. Yeah, thank you, um, Ambassador. I would agree with Margaret. I, I, I think that uh, we are far, um, uh, far ahead, further ahead than we were, let's say, 10 years ago. Uh, 10 years from now, I believe we'll be even further ahead. Uh, we are doing a lot of work to, to, to look to the future, to understand uh, what the risks are, and to, uh, to, to put into place real uh, prevention uh, initiatives uh, to ensure that we address those. One of, the, <clears throat> one of those in particular, uh, a lot of work has gone into and it has been put in place, and that is that Bering Strait uh, IMO sanctioned traffic separation uh, uh, scheme or routing. Uh, now, I also mentioned earlier in my presentation an Alaska Arctic Coast port access routing study. I wonder if the uh, organizers have that graphic available that we could just show very quickly, particularly the graphic showing around the north coast of Alaska to, uh, to let people know that this is one of the steps uh, that's being taken to uh, anticipate future increases in traffic across the northern uh, coast. And so, uh, yeah, that, and that is open for public comment. Uh, and uh, we would like a widespread uh, uh, distribution of that information so we get a variety of uh, folks commenting uh, on that port access route study. So yeah, th thanks very much. Okay, Mark, just a question. Was that graphic that you had in mind part of uh, the slides that you sent to us? It was a separate document uh, that we that I sent uh, in a PDF format. I think Marisol uh -huh. may have that. Okay. Well, if it's possible for us to show that at some point, let's do so. But I now have a number of other questions. Uh, here we go. Uh, Mark, whoop, whoop, I saw something on the screen for a minute. Yeah, there's a graphic embedded in there. If we could maybe scroll down to, there it is. There we go. So you'll see this is a conceptual uh, idea linking uh, traffic routing from the approved uh, Bering Strait access point uh, all the way across the North Slope. And we're actually collaborating with Canada uh, to continue that routing uh, across the northern coast of Canada. So again, to the question of uh, an, a fully integrated system, I think we have a lot of great pieces uh, that are that are po being pulled together to to simulate integration, but because you've got many organizations involved doing many great things, uh, I, I don't know that we're fully integrated, but there's an awful lot that has been done and more to be done. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Margaret? Can I just add one more thing? I, I think part of the picture, too, is going back to the, the issue that uh, Dr. Kataeva raised about the uh, HFO ban, and it's, it's WWF's position that uh, the best possible prevention and mitigation measures will be the, the swift and immediate ban of HFO. We, we, we would rather not see any more delays or, or waivers. So that is, I think part of the integrated system is uh, preparing for, for uh, prevention, preventing accidents by not having that HFO being carried through the Arctic. And certainly when we look at the projection of ships and cargo, which will uh, LNG, but also oil that will be coming from Russia uh, there's a massive projection of increased traffic to come through the Bering Strait. So again, a ban will help us to prevent accidents and pollution in this special marine environment. Okay, thanks for that. We have another question now, again for Dr. Kuteeva. Uh, Dr. Uh, Mark Everett mentioned that the United States has prepositioned response equipment in the Bering Strait region has Russia also pre-positioned response equipment in this region? And has Russia identified critical areas for habitat protection in the Bering Strait region? Wonder if you could uh, address that. Yes, thank you. Yes, uh, we have preposition of equipment in the Arctic waters along the uh, Russian coastline. And now we are enhancing our branches 
in uh, Kamchatka, I mean branches of MRS, and um, uh, we uh, try to strengthen in this region by special vessels and equipment. And um, uh, I would like to um, uh, recall once more that uh, in the guidelines, which now is developing under the IMO, it's also there are some recommendations to uh, maritime administration, coastal states, um, what uh, type of equipment and uh, one, uh, what um, its items should be as preposition in the port of Arctic states uh, for, uh, for, um, uh, for guarantee the um, well uh, response operation in any uh, pollution incident. And what type of equipment should be on the response um, special vessels, which also stand by in the risk uh, of a uh, area of risks. Uh, and um, in our opinion, it's uh, very important to indicate uh, the most appropriate um, equipment which should be used in this area for uh, mitigation of risk uh, of pollution incident. Uh, in our opinion, in general, of course, um, ban is ban, but nevertheless, if you will um, consider the statistics of incident in this region, uh, may say that uh, we was lucky. And in our opinion, the most important also to put into force measures for reduced risk, uh, not simply ban, uh, because um, it's very discussable what's uh, more general, uh, HFO spill or distillate spill. For our opinion, most important uh, measures uh, which could uh, mitigation and uh, reduce the risk in this area. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Natalia. Our next question, maybe to Mark, at least at first, if you're willing, uh, the question is, what is the current status of live joint exercises, for example, search and rescue or response, uh, between the, um, the Coast Guard and the Russian Federal Border Service or the Russian Marine Rescue Service, um, given uh, COVID and other sorts of limitations currently? Are there still live exercises underway, or is there kind of a hiatus at the moment? Right, thank you. So um, I'll start off by saying, um, Exercises come in many shapes and sizes. Mm -hmm. uh, an exercise can be uh, several people sitting in a room and having a, a workshop to work through uh, a potential problem or, or technical issue. Uh, that is considered an exercise. But what most people think of in terms of a, when they say live exercise, they're typically talking about uh, a full scale exercise where we actually go out and practice what an actual response would look like in terms of all of the personnel and equipment and systems in place to mimic what a, an actual response might be like. Uh, Dr. Kutieva mentioned earlier that the last of those full-scale type exercises was held between our two nations in 1998. It's quite a while ago. Um, we have plans now in our current bilateral two-year work plan to continue to move toward full-scale exercises in the Bering Straits region, but you can imagine the degree of complexity and the amount of organization that it takes to, to get something like that off the ground. And so what we are currently doing is what I'll call ramping up, and that ramping up began several years ago with smaller I'll say compartmentalized or segmented elements of what a larger full-scale exercise might look like. So we're very much in a sort of crawl, walk, run uh, approach right now that may take several years for us to get uh, to an actual full-scale exercise deployment of personnel and equipment and vessels uh, out into that area to, pr to practice the plan uh, that we currently have. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, our next question, somewhat different question, uh, and it wasn't directed to any one of you in particular, um, so I offer this up to anyone who has a view. Um, what do you think are the key factors to consider 
in order to ensure that the perspectives of indigenous communities are taken into account in developing um, the types of measures that have been uh, put in place already and the ones that will be developed in the future. How do you best incorporate indigenous people's knowledge and interests into the policy processes? Who would, Mark, go ahead. Sure, thank you. So I mentioned in my presentation, uh, the area committee for Arctic and Western Alaska. Now again, this is uh, very much focused on uh, pollution preparedness and response. And the area committee is the venue. It is the, the authorized venue for communities and organizations to come together uh, with governmental agencies to discuss what their uh, pollution prevention, preparedness and response priorities uh, are so that we have visibility of those so that we can adequately prepare to respond uh, in areas that perhaps have a higher uh, cultural value, natural resource value, uh, because you can't cover everything all the time. You have to prioritize. And so getting uh, the input from communities, uh, federally recognized tribes uh, and others is vital. Uh, and so that area committee, those meetings are held several times a year. And as I mentioned earlier, one of the big challenges is the funding available to get people literally to the table. Uh, now we do offer uh, during those uh, during those committee meetings, a virtual option to dial in or to, uh, to connect virtually. Uh, but get, you know, prior, having people prioritize that for participation uh, is a key challenge for us. And we would certainly love uh, greater involvement in the activities of those area committees as they work uh, to maintain that area contingency plan. Thanks. Thanks very much, Mark. Ed, you wanted to add something to that? Uh, Ed, you yeah, need to I, I think, uh, well, Mark talks about a marine casualty or a marine disaster and how you minimize or address those impacts and recover the oil. Uh, I think also there are other impacts that short of having a marine casualty, and that's just a, a vessel transiting through uh, communities' waters nearby. And, and what we develop with the Marine Exchange and partner with uh, other NGO, NGOs, actually, for that matter, and with the Alaska Eskimo Whaling Commission is, is a, an app where they can actually see where vessels are on their smartphones and I know what the issue is as far as where they're going. And then they can contribute and say, well, that's not a good place for them to go because that's where we normally have our hunting activities or what have you. So the first thing they need is to have an information because they can't see them. You can't stand on the shore and see these ships 10 miles offshore. But the app, they can see them coming to their community 30 miles away or 50 miles away. And they can say, well, that's not a good place for the impacts Short of a marine casualty, there are other impacts. You don't have to have marine casualty that have adverse impacts. So when you have that information, that can help them, us get information as to whether that's acceptable or not. If not, where would they like the vessel to be? Where would be less impactful? So there's other ways contributing, but we have to give them information, to even understand what the nature of the trade is. So that's another component of getting involvement in the local communities uh, in the process. Okay, thanks very much. Margaret, did you want to add something to that? Oh, just in terms of, um... Uh, ensuring full integration and, and participation of and leadership from the indigenous communities. Ed mentioned the Alaska Eskimo Whaling Commission. There are other uh, organizations uh, which are called co-management commissions, uh, co-management organizations, which work with the agencies to protect and manage the various uh, species. So they, there's the Eskimo Walrus Commission, the Nanook Co-Management Commission. Uh, there are other regional organizations with strong leadership, such as Kowarik, uh, Northwest Arctic Borough has Manilik. So there are a lot of very strong uh, regional organizations that um, can be and should be included as we go forward in this uh, contingency planning. And um, hopefully uh, we will see a, an on the ground table, uh, not tabletop, a real, real live exercise. So we will certainly need community knowledge, local knowledge about what is where and, and um, how to be involved in the response. Okay, so I have time for a couple more questions and here's one actually that interests me in particular. A uh, question is large fishing vessels uh, have been moving north within the Bering Sea as fish stocks uh, migrate further north and um, there's even the prospect that some of them would move through the Bering Strait and into the Chukchi Sea. I know that uh, Russia is considering the possibility of opening a Pollock fishery in the Chukchi Sea. 
And the question is, are these vessels, large fishing vessels, tracked and bound by the traffic lane restrictions? And what controls protections are in place with respect to these fishing vessels? Who has a, a view on that? Ed, please. Depending on the size of the fishing vessel, there's, there's certain criteria as far as IMO, as far as 300 gross tons, 400 gross tons, whether you have to have a tracking system or not. But most of these fishing vessels, they're large enough to go up there. They are currently being tracked and monitored by automatic identification systems. They carry those on board. Bear in mind that the traffic separation scheme is not a mandatory scheme. It's, it's a standard of care. You cannot write a ticket for not being in that lane. Okay, but basically it's a standard of care and through influence and reminding people or mariners that is that this is the, the standard of care. They're going to follow that because they don't follow the standard of care and there's an accident provided it's not ice in the way I might add. But you know, if there's, if there's ice in the way they're going to go outside that traffic lane. If you have a traffic accident, you go outside the highway, if you will. But if things are normal, they'll go through that traffic lane because if something goes wrong, they're much more liable for not following the good marine practice that other mariners follow. So we have a very high compliance, 99% compliance rate. You don't have that on the highway, I might add. We have 99% compliance rate without regulations by just notifying vessels that is a standard of care. So it does work and fishing vessels are being monitored and can be managed if we know where they are, then we can determine if that's a good place or not to be. And then, and, but you need that information first to even manage the manage a fleet. You can't manage something you don't know where it is. So that's the first step is having the information so you can do management and the communications so you can get back to the vessel and tell them in the wrong area doing the wrong thing. Thanks very much, Ed. Um, you know, we have received about 25 more questions, but we don't have any more time except for one. And so more or less at random, I'll ask uh, this one. I think it may go to Dr. Kuteyeva if she's willing. Uh, doctor, you mentioned that the IMO correspondence group, uh, the drafting guidelines for the use of um, HFO in the Arctic needs input from environmental organizations. Um, the question is, can you please reiterate the, what question you feel the environmental group should address in providing this input? Excuse me, I uh, don't clear catch the question. What's the impact? Uh, so uh, when you were speaking earlier, you spoke about the IMO correspondence group. Yes. That is uh, looking at the question of heavy fuel oil and the potential for a phase out or ban of that. And you mentioned that um, there was a, a need for environmental groups to uh, provide some input into this process. I think the question is, what in particular were you hoping to hear or do you think the IMO needs to hear from these environmental groups with respect to this question? Okay. Yes, uh, I mentioned that um, there are uh, two outstanding issues uh, on which uh, we haven't um, support uh, majority of participants' correspondence group. Therefore, for us, very important uh, to reply, uh, to respond uh, environmental organization. First, this is uh, so-called sunset provisions. Because I mentioned some uh, participants, uh, I mean um, uh, IMO members, states, not NGO, uh, they consider that these guidelines should apply only for the purpose of granting waves and thus should be retended in the time of the HFO band uh, would uh, enter into force in 2029. But in our opinion, the provisions of guidelines could be used not only for HFO spills, because all requirements, I mean navigational requirement, all training and drills, all communication, because guidelines um, is covered uh, very wide uh, measures for reduce risk. Therefore, such measures could be used not only for HFO, but in our opinion, for other type of fuel, for instance, distillate. Therefore, for us, it will be better don't uh, establish so-called 
sunset provisions. And now it's open. And second, uh, as I mentioned, uh, in the guidelines, Russian Federation proposed to establish um, uh, the, uh, specified equipment which should be in the port of Arctic uh, states to guarantee the effective um, oil spill response operation. And such equipment also should be uh, on board of uh, special um, vessels, TAC, uh, which uh, is standby in the region, also for uh, guarantee the effective and timely reply to any pollution incident. But some participants of correspondence group consider that such uh, detailed information uh, is too uh, prescriptive. They uh, uh, advocate to general uh, phrase without any specification. But we consider that it's necessary, especially taking into account that these guidelines, as all IMO guidelines, is voluntary. It's not mandatory. Why we cannot uh, specify such equipment in non-mandatory equipment, uh, non-mandatory guidelines? It will be such as um, orienteer, as uh, uh, example, which could be uh, on the port. This is second question, which also necessary to support or not support. Thank you. Okay. Well, as uh, much as I might like to continue, I think we are out of time. Uh, let me stop here and thank everyone who has been listening and sending in questions. Those of you who did not get your question uh, posed in the session, I suspect that each of the speakers would be open to hearing from you directly. And uh, maybe you can find a way to reach out to them um, with your questions. And with, it, with that, I'd like to thank all of our speakers for your presentations and your willingness to get up early or stay up late as the case may be. I want to thank uh, particularly WWF and our friends at the University of New Hampshire for helping to organize this event, including uh, my colleagues at the Wilson Center for, uh, for running this event uh, so smoothly. And with that, uh, I'd like to uh, sign off. I do uh, encourage all of you with an interest in Arctic and Antarctic matters to consider the other Wilson Center events later this week. Yes, and Margaret is reminding me, I should mention one more time, uh, safety at the helm, a plan for smart shipping through the Bering Strait. I encourage everyone to take a hard look at that, particularly its recommendations. With that, thank you all so much. Take care.